All right, this is the fourth section of um, data basics. This is following the textbook relatively closely, although with a little extra information and not focusing on certain aspects of that. This is about sampling and generalizability. The learning objectives are a little ambitious for this video, so I suspect it's going to be longer than I would prefer, but this is really important stuff to get. I mean, this class, there's just a lot to do. Um, you need to identify conceptual versus operational statements and definitions, understand some basic sampling things like population versus samples, why we would use random sampling and what its limitations are, how to determine the generalizability of data, what that means, and also what kinds of factors influence generalizability. Let's tackle conceptual and operational definitions. In research, in research endeavors, we have two ways of naming we're talking about almost all of our concepts. So specifically, our variables, our hypotheses, our, our, um, our processes or relationships between the variables. And there are name, there are conceptual ways of doing this, and there are operational ways of doing this. So conceptual ways of doing this, this usually comes directly from the theory. This is not tied to a particular way of doing things. This is um, a really vague and general way of doing things. I sort of think of this as being like political speech, for instance. So when a person says, I love America, you're like, you, I think if you're a critically thinking person, you say, what do you mean America? And what do you mean love? Some of those concepts are disturbing. You know, this, this person should really define what he means by love America. Does that mean he goes around serving Americans? Or does it mean he has a deep and abiding feeling towards Americans. And what does he mean by Americans? Does he include Puerto Ricans? Does he include Alaskans? I mean, some people don't. So a conceptual definition of something is so general that it's kind of hard to know exactly how it should be um, defined in a specific situation. So it could apply to a lot of situations. And that's how theories are crafted. You try and get things conceptual so they're real, so that they work. But, uh, and they imply certain things in certain situations but they don't fix that down. They don't nail that down quite yet. Operationalization is nailing everything down. An operational name or definition or something is a very specific way of implementing a conceptual definition. And so it's tied to a specific research study or a specific situation, and it requires a, a specific measurement method. For any given conceptual anything, there are many, sometimes infinite, possible operationalizations or operational versions of it, operational definitions. So let's go to conceptual land, which I always draw as a cloud. And let's say that from a particular theory, we get this research question that happiness might be associated with lapses in self-control. That's extremely general. What do you mean happiness? How do you measure that? How do you define it? What do you mean associated with? What do you mean a lapse in self-control? How do you define any of that? Well, you might come up with a hypothesis that's a little more specific, but if you express that hypothesis using those same terms, you still have an extremely general conceptual statement or prediction. In fact, you have this new general thing, self-control relevant situations. There's any number of those. You have to decide on one to, de to define, decide whether this thing is going to happen. So let's decide on one. Let's say there's a scale called the current mood scale, and that's how we define happiness in this study. So for one study, we say happiness is your score on the current mood scale, which is a self-administered, self-report, uh, Likert scale, item questionnaire. And association, let's say that's the Pearson correlation coefficient, the standard correlation coefficient. And if there's um, a significant number there, a positive or negative, then yeah, the hypothesis is supported. And then self-control, and also self-control relevant situation is kind of implied in this. Let's just also ask people how many self-reported regrets they have in the past 24 hours, regrets for things where they didn't show enough self-control. And so is there going to be an association, a, a Pearson correlation coefficient uh, that's not zero between people's score on the current root scale and the number of regrets involving self-control situations in the past 24 hours? So that's one way to do this. But here's another way. Let's give half the subject $50. Let's recruit them and divide them in half. And that's the self-control relevant situation set up here. And then the association will be compare, comparing the people who got $50 to the people who got no gift, no, no $50. And 
the self-control situation and the difference and, and the thing we measure is going to be we sit them in a room with a donut and tell them to wait and we just keep them waiting for like an hour and eventually they eat the donut even though it's not theirs and we just see how long it takes them to eat the forbidden donut so we could operationalize this entire study this way or we can do it this way we could ask people on a scale from 1 to 10 how, how happy are you and then we can do a chi-squared test of independence to see if there's an association because chi-square is an association thing that we'll learn later in the semester. If there's an association between their score on this happiness scale of 1 to 10, and the, and the 10 things that they list if they, that they would do if they knew they would not get caught. So we'll say, list 10 things you would like to do to someone if you knew you wouldn't get caught. People generally list a few antisocial or possibly criminal things if you ask them this. So, and there are an infinite number of others. So this is how we operationalize things. Now, skipping gears, populations versus samples. Research questions can almost never be answered directly. That is by, quote, going to the source. So let's say is happiness associated with lapses in self-control. How could you answer this directly? What is the source? That's kind of a ridiculous concept. It's because this is a theory that's supposed to apply to a lot of situations and therefore a lot of people and a lot of like, places in the world and time periods even. There is no one way to test this. There is no one direct way to do this. You test it in a bunch of places and if it tests out well over and over and over again in a variety of places where it should test well, then <clears throat> you find some support for the theory. So since we can't go to quote unquote the source, we usually sample from a population. Now, a sample is small, a population is big. A sample is a subset of a population. A sample is some possible observations. A population is all possible observations. So we have to decide which population before we can sample, which seems backwards, but it's the way things go. So to what individuals does the research question apply? Is happiness associated with lapses in self-control? All humans? All seven billion? That's not, you can't do that. 300 million, you can't do that either. There are all sorts of problems that we run into when we try and get information from the whole population. Even thinking about it usually makes our brains explode because it's just ridiculous. So we have to sample instead. So here's where we're at. Addressing a research question requires operationalizing everything and specifying the target population. And then you have to sample from that population then you have to do the study. So things are getting complicated pretty quickly. Well, the sampling proportion is just as critical as anything else, and often we get hung up here because in a lot of fields we do really sloppy sampling. <coughs> Psychology. <coughs> anyway, what kind of sample are we going to use? The answer is representative. If it's not a representative sample, then we've got some problems, then we can't generalize the results very easily from the sample to the population. Or rather than saying you just can or can't generalize, it's much more useful to say we can do it. We're less confident in generalizing or we're more confident because there's no perfect sample. So a representative sample, what that means is it's representative. The sample is representative of the population. When Bill Clinton was elected president many, many years ago, he said, for once my cabinet will look like America. And what he meant is there are black people in America, there will be black people in my cabinet. There are women in America, there will be women in my cabinet. There are Asians in America, there will be Asians in my cabinet. There are babies in America. No, he didn't go that far. He, he didn't hire any babies, as far as I know. Also, his cabinet didn't look quite as much like America as he had hoped, but there was a little diversity in them, I suppose. So to be truly representative, our sample should be a miniature version of the population. It should be like you took a whole picture of the population and you shrunk it down to a tiny size. So everything that's in the population, all characteristics, should be in the sample in the same proportions. If there are 16% African Americans in the, in the population, there should be 16% in the, in the sample. If 3% of the people in the population have major depressive disorder, that same percentage of your sample should have major depressive disorder. Every possible characteristic that is relevant to your study needs to be represented like that. As you can see, this is a high bar and technically probably kind of impossible to reach, but we can definitely do better or worse. Now, option one, which people have tried a lot in the past, is purposive sampling, sometimes intentional sampling, uh, direct sampling. I think there are different terms for it, but purposive is the most common, I think. 
And that is, you choose just the right combination of, of individuals. You make, but you have to make sure that you know and then get all the important characteristics. So statistics punishes you for ignorance. And if you don't know which characteristics are important, you're going to be hating it uh, around the time you try and publish, or after you publish when somebody figures out that your results are crazy. This is an extremely difficult thing to do, to know all the characteristics and then to sample. Option number two is to use the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers just says that the average of many, many, many random samples of something would be the same as the thing itself. So the average of many, many random samples, technically an infinite number, of random samples from a population, all those averages will be the same as the population. So random samples over time with repeated sampling give us the characteristics of the population. And this is why we do random sampling more often than any other kind. Well, we try to do random sampling more often than any other kind. We don't have to worry about carefully choosing our subjects and carefully choosing the characteristics. We just worry about being random. The big limitation, of course, is that representativeness is, is not guaranteed in any particular sample. It's only guaranteed on the average after you've taken an infinite number of random samples and average across all of them. So what we really want to do is just make sure that everybody in an entire scientific field does random sampling. And then after 20 or 30 or 100 studies have been done on a particular thing, then the average of those things is much more likely to be representative than any individual sample was. But we can help a lot by figuring out how big our samples should be to have a pretty good chance of even being representative. And as it turns out, large samples are much more likely to be representative than small ones. And large doesn't have to be gigantic. You don't need half of a population necessarily to represent it if you're using random. So a simple random sample is like this. You have the population here. All these people are your population. Imagine that the colors represent, say, ethnicity or something like that. And then you, just, you draw a sample of n. n is your sample size of n observations randomly, random selection. The definition of random selection is that everybody in the target population has an equal chance of being in the sample. Oh my goodness, my graphics messed up when this converted. Oh, how do we fix this? We could do this. Oh, there's a schedule as it stands right now. Yeah, did I fix it? Hey, hooray! Some people kind of fell out of the sample. Anyway, so the definition of random sampling is that every member of this population has exactly the same chance of being selected for the sample as every other member of the population. That's random selection. But the selection has to be truly random. You are not random. No matter how random your friends told you you were in high school, that was just something they were saying because that was 90s things to say, um, or 2000s, whatever. You can't be random, no matter how hard you try. There's plenty of research showing that humans are not random, and even when we try hard, we aren't. So use an actual random process. So how generalizable are the results of our study? Well, if we used a, a random or a stratified or a cluster sampling, then they're probably pretty, it was a good strategy. If we used purposeful or purposive sampling, that can also be good if it was done well, but convenient sampling and self-selected sampling are not good. Unfortunately, convenient sampling, self-selecting sampling are what we do in psychology and a lot of the sciences involving people. Because as it turns out, it's hard to make people participate in studies. So you can randomly sample from all college students, but can you force those college students that you randomly selected to actually respond to your survey or show up to your lab and do your study? No. So often we do convenience sampling, which means we sample the people that are convenient to sample. So intro psych students, yay. And those are also self-selecting samples. That's also not random and tends to be non-representative. So intro psych students who bothered to sign up for your study, that's pretty bad. So the next consideration is how well was the strategy implemented? Simple random samples, uh, we need to know if the process was truly random or not. Did it happen the way it was supposed to happen? Even if it was random, did that happen? So did you randomly sample and did people actually show up? 
Did people actually fill out your surveys? Did they do what they were supposed to do? Convenience and self-selecting samples, they're, they're not the greatest choice and they tend to be non-representative, but even here you can make it more representative by making some certain decisions. You can um, do a good convenience or self-selecting sample. Like you can choose a group or groups that themselves are representative. So if, if I have a convenience sample from Ohio State students, that's probably more representative of the general population than a convenience sample of Harvard students. Because Ohio State students, it's not a, an elite school and a lot of people go to college. So it probably has a, a decent representativeness of people in Ohio, which is the deep, decent representativeness of the average of America. Um, but Harvard, no, these are very different from, Ameri from your average America on a number of variables. Now finally, if you can document the reasons people probably self-selected, then maybe you can correct for them later. So for all sampling strategies, we need to consider whether we actually were likely to hit the intended target population. So sometimes we state our intended target population, but then what we do doesn't match that. So a classic example is the Dewey Beats Truman thing where the newspaper who reported this used a telephone poll and they thought that their target population was all people who might vote, when in fact it was just all people who might vote who actually have telephones. And back in the day, only wealthy people could afford telephones and wealthy people were more likely to be Republican. So they actually got the opinions of Republicans more than just the opinions of everybody. So if your target population you think is a certain thing, but the way you do stuff actually makes the real target population that you're sampling from uh, be a different thing, then you've got a problem. There can also be unseen obstacles, like you're doing a survey that involves people watching a video. Well, people need to have high-speed internet, because those dial-up people, they're going to be waiting all night for that video to load. And so you've selected in ways that you didn't plan on. Your sample size makes a big difference, too. A sample size between 30 and 100 is often fairly okay for most purposes. Now, most, re most polling places use sample sizes of, of maybe 500 to a couple of thousand. And that's to represent all Americans, all 300 million of us. So that's pretty amazing. You often don't need a very big percentage of the population to get a decent uh, representativeness of that sample, or of that population. And the response or completion rate. That's the percentage of the targeted people in the, recruit, in the recruitment process who responded. That's the response rate. So let's say you put ads out to intro sex students. How many of the people who saw the, the recruitment materials on SONA systems or in their class actually showed up? And then how many of those who showed up participated? Now, often you're only analyzing a few variables from a research experiment or a questionnaire. Well, what percentage of people answered those variables? I study some creepy things that are really personal for a lot of people, and sometimes people choose not to answer my questions. And there's probably systematic differences between the, those who choose to answer and those who don't. So I have a, a problem with non-completion and non-response. The final consideration here is some things are just human. So if you're studying the the response rate of a particular neuron, how many milliseconds it takes for that neuron to fire after a light shines on your eyes, I would argue you probably don't need to care whether you have a random sample very much. Now, to really refine things, someday you're going to need a random sample, but you're probably going to get a pretty good idea of how that works if you get a, a convenient sample of undergrads. But if you're studying, like I do, things like attitudes about rape, you probably need to get a specific and fairly representative sample um, to be able to say this represents all X people because those attitudes are going to be culturally bound. I probably, if I sample Fredonia students, I can't say that this applies to students in Nigeria or Saudi Arabia, for instance, because they're in a different culture. Finally, replicate and replicate and replicate some more. The more we replicate, the more confident we are. So here we go. Here's my little chart. We can imagine high confidence in generalizability. Generalizability means applying my results and thinking my results probably a work with the whole population, not just my sample. So I can have high confidence in my generalizability or lower confidence. So we can look at the different sampling types and for simple random or stratified or, or simple random stratified sampling or cluster sampling, if you have good implementation, you've got high confidence. Now like anything else, if you implement it terribly, you could drop down to very low confidence.
Purpose of sampling, same deal. If you do it really well, but it's harder to do that well, then you can have um, either good or bad confidence there. But convenience or self-selected sampling, even with good implementation, you probably can't get very high confidence, maybe a sort of medium confidence in generalizability there and under the best of conditions. Another set of conditions, uh, of considerations, is even if you have high confidence from the sampling strategy and the implement implementation, then there are some other things to consider that modify that. So if you're up here in this range, or maybe even in the top of this range, um, did you actually hit your target population? Did you actually sample from your target populations? If yes, then you can still have high confidence. If you had some small problems, you're losing confidence. But if you had large problems, you're definitely losing confidence if you really missed that target population. If your sample size was less than 30, then no matter how good, how good your implementation is, you should be questioning whether this particular study is representative. And you should just go for replications, hope that somebody replicates. But if you've got between like maybe 30 and 100 or above, you have a decent level of confidence. Higher is better. Some set types of studies, you need hundreds. And then response completion rate, you need a fairly high response completion rate to stay confident as far as that goes. This is where I'm going to end this lecture. Now for optional content, you can look in the textbook or you can ask me if you want to have some slides on stratified and cl cluster sampling, which I've mentioned. They're good methods and they include um, random sampling. They're uh, modifications of random sampling. But they're, they are specifically not going to be on any exam. So if you're curious, let me know or you can look in the textbook, there's some information on those.